We've spoken about the antiquity of Christ, but what about the antiquity of the church? And we said before that from our point of view, we're looking at the church as the martyrs, the witnesses, people who have seen Jesus Christ and who have suffered for it, even if they weren't perhaps killed. So what about that? Eusebius, in order to defend himself against the accusations of porphyry and other pagan philosophers, has to establish the divine nature of the church as well. Not that the church is God, but that the church comes from a divine source, a, that the church always existed in some form, at least in regard to, at least as a reference to Jesus Christ. So, Eusebius quotes a very interesting passage from the Jewish prophet Isaiah, who, by the way, was supposedly killed by being sawed in half. And he says, quotes, quoting this prophecy, a new people with a new name shall be blessed upon the earth. Who are these new people with the new name? Well, to Eusebius, it's the Christians. And um, I really want to take some time and explain why Eusebius was making that equation to, to the people in 312. Why, was he, why did he see the church as being the fulfillment of this prophecy? Because... Eusebius was a contemporary of his hero, Constantine. Now this is a very controversial issue, and especially when we get, we're only the, at the beginning of our lectures, when we get to Eusebius' opinions about Constantine, because a lot of people have a lot of opinions which aren't very favorable. It's very clear that Constantine delivered the church from their persecutors, and that he was the first Christian empire, emperor. But his moral standing is certainly the subject of debate. But, again, I think that Eusebius was more concerned about the practical as aspects of, Euse of Constantine here. The bottom line was, the church in Eusebius' day was delivered from these persecutions. And especially from the worst persecution, which was from about 303 to 313. Constantine came along, defeated the enemy emperors who were persecuting the church. And he did something that was really major in terms of history and in terms of Eusebius' mind, own mind. He made Christianity legal. So because of this, Eusebius saw this prophecy as being fulfilled. Because of this, Eusebius said the church is blessed upon the earth, because the emperor Constantine was now favoring the church. After, for years, the Christians were the bad guys. Now, we need some statistics on this to try to give you a picture of where the church was at earlier in time between the time of Christ and Constantine? For instance, at the beginning of the second century, 100 AD, there were 60 million Romans, 6 million Jews, which would make the Jews, Jewish people, in terms of our thinking, a minority, a big minority. That's what they would be considered in today's lingo. The Christians, there, was, there were maybe 60,000 Christians in 100 AD. So Eusebius lived in the 300s, so how many Christians were there? A couple million? But it's important to look at these numbers here, that the Jews were one of the big minorities, the Christians were a smaller minority. And in Eusebius' own time, which we will talk about in the later chapters, the Christians were delivered and made a legal religion by an emperor who favored them. So therefore Eusebius saw the Christians as being blessed upon the earth. And therefore, the whole idea of them being a new group, that fit in with prophecy. But of course, there's another part to that, because he still had to establish that Christianity was really an old religion, and that it just wasn't something someone made up as they went along. He said very clearly, Christianity is the same religion practiced by Abraham and all righteous Jews. So he directly connects Christianity with Judaism. Wow. We've heard that before, right? something the Jewish people and Muslims certainly don't agree with. But um, then again, the connections have always been undeniable. The point that Eusebius was making is really traditional Christianity. It's what St. Paul taught. And again, I wanted to assert that 
You may disagree with Eusebius' theology and Christianity, but it is absolutely true that Christianity did claim that Christ was God and that the church was predicted by the prophets too. This idea that people would come along, people who weren't Jewish would come along and accept the God of the Jewish people, who was actually the God of all people. So Eusebius is claiming that, but with one distinction. Eusebius is following St. Paul in theology directly here. And how's he doing that? He connects Christians more with Abraham than Moses. Well, it's for obvious reasons, because Moses was the giver of the law. And Christians didn't follow the law because Christians believed that Christ fulfilled the law. And that if we believe in Christ, that's sufficient. So therefore, it was necessary for Eusebius to equate Christians with Abraham, who did not have the law. It says in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, that Abraham believed God and that this was counted to him for righteousness. So in other words, Abraham didn't have to do the law, but he had to believe the doctrine of faith, so that's why Eusebius repeats this very clear doctrine of St. Paul in regard to what the real connection was. So on the one hand, he, said, he says that the Jewish people prepared the way for Christ with the law of Moses, which, which is a law of righteousness. Do not kill, do not steal, and all the other things. But then he also, but then he also says that it's through Abraham that there's a direct connection. Because Abraham had faith. And Christians believe in Christ through faith, that he fulfilled the Jewish law, and is also God. So that, that is his, that's Eusebius' statement about the connection. Now, it's important to remember that Eusebius came again, as we mentioned at the beginning, from Caesarea, which was kind of the Gentile city in Israel. And it always was, even from the time when the Romans first conquered the Jewish people under Pompey, and we're going to talk about that, because in our next lecture series, in our next couple segments, we're going to be talking more about history, the history itself, the prehistory that led up to Christ, just like we're talking about the theology that leads up to Christ in these particular segments. So in focusing on that, we can talk about Caesarea, and this was a city that was always Greco-Roman. And it was a city that was always important to the church because the main teachers of Eusebius had a school of theology in Caesarea. And who do I mean? I mean the great theologian and martyr, Origen. Origen was very controversial for many reasons. But he was certainly a great teacher of the church. Whatever we disagree with him about, well, there's always disagreements. But Origen had a, founded a school of theology in Caesarea about a generation before Eusebius was born. Origen had a, a pupil named Pamphilus. Pamphilus was the teacher of Eusebius. And Pamphilus was martyred. And Eusebius was the witness to the martyrdom of his teacher. So you see the chain of command here. Origen, this theologian, Pamphilus, Eusebius. And this was all in Caesarea. And I speak of this to show you also about the whole idea of the church and the continuity of the church. And how, again, the, the idea was that the church also had an antiquity. And that church also has a continuity of thought from before Christ as well as, answer, as, well as after Christ. So you see even in Eusebius' own city, we see a a direction and a path of teaching. Okay. Also here, we see something else. Eusebius was in jail too during the persecutions, but they let him go. People have a lot of opinions about that. I, I mention this because, again, I want to talk about Eusebius as a witness to the martyrs who were witnesses to Christ since we're talking about the church, which, is the martyr, which are the martyrs, the witnesses. So Eusebius also suffered, but they let him go. He was not killed like his teacher. People think that was because of a lot of reasons. That his parents were powerful people. Some people think other things as well. In the days of martyrdom, 
if you, if you were let go, th- people sometimes thought you were a traitor. Now, I'm not saying that Eusebius was or that he did anything, but there were certain thoughts. And um, we don't know why Eusebius was able to escape, but be- thank God he did because he gives us the history. And Eusebius then concludes one of, another one of our major themes. He gives a definition of Christianity. This is his answer to Porphyry. Christianity is as a primitive, unique, and true religion. Primitive because it always existed. Unique because it is different than the other religions and than paganism. And true because this is the revelation of God to man. This is God's love for man. So this assertion is what the book is about. And this assertion is going to be dealt with in all the various chapters as we discuss mainly the martyrs, but also as we discuss the heretics, also as we discuss the emperors. And I did want to, certainly Eusebius does divide his book into the different periods when the emperors ruled as well. The idea that it started off with the bad emperors, but then it ends with Constantine, and that's a blessing for the church. So all these things work towards Eusebius establishing this, Christianity as the primitive, unique, and true religion.